So as we're going to move on and talk about video now and capturing audio is an essential part of filming video, let's start setting up the camera by bringing up the Rode VideoMic Pro, which I've got down here. Okay, to set it up, you just slot that into the hot shoe mount here. Let's just try and get it in. And then you tighten up this dial here until it clamps down. There, that's nice and tight. Then you get the mini jack and open up the flap. And that goes into the bottom terminal, which is just there. And plug that in fully. Don't forget to turn the microphone on at the back here and make it a habit of looking for that green light because it's really easy to forget to switch the microphone on. If you do forget, you'll end up with no audio at all because by just plugging in an external microphone like this, you automatically disable the camera's built-in mic. This is the inbuilt mic here. There's one there and one there. And it's really low quality mic. I'd never record my audio using the inbuilt mic like this unless I just wanted to get some reference sound. As I've already mentioned, sound is an extremely important part of video production. It really is as important as your images. But DSLRs like the 700D aren't primarily designed for shooting video. They're designed for taking still photos. As such, audio recording is more of an afterthought than anything else. And there are several limitations which I'll talk more about in a moment. The VideoMic Pro does overcome these limitations to some degree. But if you want to record really good quality sound when you're shooting with a DSLR, you need to use professional XLR mics connected to a separate audio recorder. So let's finish setting up the camera for movie recording. To get into the right mode, you need to push this power switch up to the camera icon, which is here. So if I switch that up, when you do that, you might notice that the live view is automatically activated. And you'll also notice that the aspect ratio changes on the back of the camera there. This camera records HD video in the standard 16 by 9 ratio, which is more rectangular than the 3 by 2 ratio that most cameras like this use for still photos. So that's why these black stripes have appeared above and below the image. You can still take a photo when you're in movie recording mode by pressing the shutter button, but the photo you take will be 16 by 9. Now let's go into the main menu to check that our settings are right. So if I press the menu button there, in video mode you'll notice that there are two additional tabs which have appeared, that one there and that one there. But the first thing that I want to check is in the second setup tab, and it's this thing here at the bottom, video system. It should be set to PAL because that's a standard for the UK. We've already got PAL selected so we don't need to do anything. Now let's navigate over to the second video tab because we want to look at this one here, move the record size. This will determine the frame size as well as the frame rate for your video. If we press set, we can look at the different options. So if we press the set button now, for high definition video, you want a frame size of 1920 by 1080. That's 1920 pixels running horizontally across the screen by 1080 pixels running vertically. As for frame rate, that refers to the number of individual frames or shots taken by the camera every second to create your video. 25 frames per second is the standard in PAL areas, although you could choose 24 frames per second for a dreamier, more filmic look. This camera also offers 50 frames per second in that option there, um, but this is only at the smaller 720 HD frame size, which means the quality isn't going to be as good as full HD. There's no need to choose this frame rate unless you're shooting fast moving objects like in sports or unless you want to create a slow motion effect with your footage in post production. I'll just stick with the standard 1920 25 for now. So if I select that and then I press the set button, like so, that's set. Now let's move down to the sound recording option and select it. So if we go down and press set, this screen shows us the sound recording options. This is the audio meter at the bottom here and these bars are registering the sound that the microphone is picking up. As you can see, they're jumping up and down as I speak. There are two bars because there are two channels of audio, one for the left ear and one for the right. At the moment, this option here, sound rec or sound recording, is set to auto. This means that the camera is controlling the audio levels for us. That is, it's registering the sound it can hear and adjusting that audio signal to give us what it thinks is a consistent audio level. As you can see, the sound of my voice is pushing the bars up quite close to the top of the meter. The aim with audio is never to hit the top of the meter because that's when your sound will clip and sound distorted. In auto, the camera will consistently work to make sure that that doesn't happen, applying a limiter when the sound's too loud, and this is a good thing. But on the downside when you're in auto, the camera also boosts levels when they're too quiet, which can result in a lot of background hiss. You can only get consistency by setting your levels manually, but with the DSLR, this isn't necessarily the best or the easiest option. Before I explain why, let's have a go at switching the camera over into manual audio. So if I press on set, and then navigate down to manual, and then press set again, 
you notice that that activates this record level option here, which I'll just navigate to, so that one there. So if I press set now and go into record level, we've got this level with these two arrows at either side and a white arrow in the middle. You can adjust it using these arrows here, you see that arrow moving down, or you can use these cross keys, which I prefer to do. I'm adjusting the audio to suit the level of my voice, so I need to keep talking as I'm making the adjustments, and if I keep going up, you'll notice that the level starts to hit the red right at the top of the meter. This is way too loud, and the audio would be distorted. For safety, what we want is to have the audio so it's metering around the number 12, just to the right of centre, so that should be about right. On a camera designed for shooting video, you'd have an audio meter like this one permanently displayed on your monitor. You'd also have an easy way to adjust your levels according to the change in sound environment, and you'd have a way to plug a pair of headphones in so you can listen to what you're recording. But on a DSLR you don't get any of these things, which is why sound on a DSLR can be a little difficult to work with. This audio meter here is hidden away in the menu, and you can't adjust your levels without fiddling around like we've just done. Also, there's no headphone jack, so you really have no way of knowing what's going on with your audio after you've completed the initial setup. As such, I can't recommend setting your audio levels manually unless you've got a controlled shooting environment and you know the sound that you're going to be recording is going to stay relatively consistent. So a sit-down interview or something like that would be fine. Otherwise, you might want to stick with auto. Having said that, if you can set your levels manually, apart from ensuring consistency, there is another big advantage. You can deal with the hiss, which is one more thing that makes recording sound on a DSLR problematic. It's consistent background noise that comes from poor internal audio circuitry on most DSLRs. To reduce that hiss, you need to use an external microphone like this Rode video mic here. All you need to do is go to the back of the mic and on the dB switch, turn it to plus 20 dB, which is going to boost your sound. Next, you need to go to the camera's audio levels menu, which is this one here, and the signal is now registering right up at the top and it's going red. So you need to dial that down until it's just to the right of center around the 12 dB mark. So if I keep talking now, that's about right. So as you can see, it's quite low. By dialing the audio down in the camera and boosting the audio in the mic, you're effectively handing responsibility for amplifying the audio over to the Rode video mic, which is better equipped for the job. And as a result, you're bypassing the poor audio circuitry of the DSLR, which would normally produce that hissy background noise. This only works when you set your levels manually. If you're in auto, don't try boosting your mic sensitivity because you'll just make your audio noisier and more inconsistent than ever. So as we're in a controlled environment now, I'm gonna leave this audio set to manual for the time being. And as we've got the camera all set up for video, let's leave the menu and talk about shooting. So firstly, some basics. When you're shooting video, the way you handle the camera is very important. And it's very different from the way that you handle the camera when taking photos. Firstly, if you've never shot video before, you should bear this in mind. Photos can either be landscape, which is horizontal, or portrait, which is vertical. But with video, you should always shoot with the camera held horizontally. The other main thing that you need to consider when it comes to handling the camera is the fact that with video, you're recording something continuous. So you need to find a way to keep the camera steady. Otherwise, you end up with footage that wobbles and moves all over the place. This not only looks unprofessional, but it can also be hard for the audience to watch. The best way to avoid this is to try and use a tripod at all times. This will not only ensure that your shots are steady, but also it'll slow you down so that you're filming in a more considered and careful way. You should only go handheld when you really need to. If you do have to go handheld, let me just give you a few tips on how to hold the camera because it's different from when you're shooting photographs. One of the main reasons for this is because the viewfinder is deactivated when you're in video mode. So you have to use this monitor at the back to view what you're shooting. I'd also recommend that you take the monitor out of the recess and twist it around like this so you can hold onto it. You don't really need to hold onto the lens unless your shot requires a change in focus. And then, so if you're holding onto the viewfinder like that, your other hand is holding onto the body of the camera as normal. So that's two points of contact, but you need three to ensure any kind of stability. For that, I'd use the strap. So let me just take off this. So if you put the strap around your neck, and then hold the body as before, and then make sure you pull it taunt so the whole thing is braced. The other thing you can do is drop your elbows into your body, which will give you a little bit more stability. Finally, try and keep the lens as wide as possible, so you don't want it zoomed in at all. If the lens is zoomed in, any small movements will be amplified in your shot. Also, make sure that you've got the image stabiliser turned on, as this will help eliminate any slight handshake. 
Handheld shooting can be very tiring and holding the camera steady for any lengthy period of time takes practice and stamina. If you have a lot of handheld shooting to do, you may want to invest in some kind of shoulder rig or handheld stabiliser. This would not only make it easier to keep your shot steady, but also to film for longer durations of time. Handheld shooting is also hard because it's tempting to just keep moving the camera around all the time, but you really can't do that. You have to hold your shot steady and let what's happening in front of the camera be the focus, not the camera movements. And if you do move, there has to be a reason for it. To stop me from being distracted and moving around all the time, I try to hold a shot for a set period by counting up to 15 in my head and then smoothly adjusting my position to another shot. That way I can ensure I've got a nice steady shot that smoothly shifts into another nice steady shot. Unsteady footage is not the only thing that might prove to be distracting for your audience. Changes to things like exposure, focus and white balance are also undesirable. What you want to aim for is consistency. And although that's not always possible on your audio with a DSLR, it is with your visuals. And you do that by keeping everything set to manual. So let's explore that for a bit now. If I take this off and if I switch it to manual on the mode dial and just place it on the table. One of the most important things that you can keep constant when you're shooting video on a DSLR is this, your shutter speed, which is that number there. People often get confused between shutter speed and frames per second. Frames per second, otherwise known as frame rate, is how many individual frames or shots the camera takes within each second. When these shots are played back one after another, they look like a continually moving image, and this is the illusion of film. Shutter speed, on the other hand, refers to how long the shutter opens to take each of these individual frames or shots. There's a general rule of thumb when you're shooting with a DSLR, and that is to keep your shutter speed at double your frame rate. So as we're shooting at a rate of 25 frames per second, we should set our shutter speed to 1 50th of a second, which is what it's set to right now. This will give us the most comfortable viewing results, and if you don't stick to 50, you're not going to completely ruin your footage, but it will look different. If you set a higher shutter speed, the footage will feel more choppy, and if you set a lower shutter speed, you'll get more motion blur. But unless your aim is to achieve a dreamlike feeling or to make your video look like an intense action film, it's best to stick with 50. Sticking to a shutter speed of 50 means that you have to control your exposure using the aperture and ISO settings. These settings are often sufficient to expose your shot correctly, but if you're ever in a very bright environment, you may need to put a neutral density filter or an ND filter onto your lens to reduce the amount of light that comes in. Just to show you one, this is an ND filter, and it's basically a pair of sunglasses for your camera. So I'll just put that down. With your exposure set manually, you have complete control over your image, and the camera won't make any adjustments that you don't want it to, but you are going to have to keep an eye on things within your scene so that you're able to make necessary adjustments to your exposure. For example, if the light in your scene changes or if you move from one location to another. Although I always prefer to shoot manually, there are some scenarios in which I'd use automatic exposure. One example is a shot that travels from a dark place to a light place. In automatic, the camera will automatically adjust the exposure for you, resulting in a smooth transition from one location to the next. The situation is the same with focus. Manual is usually best because it prevents the camera from making arbitrary adjustments while you're shooting. But autofocus does have quite a few advantages, especially if things are moving within your shot. You remember that this camera can track focus points such as faces. Trying to adjust your focus manually to follow moving objects is really hard. And if you let the camera do it for you, you'll probably get much smoother results. This is helped by the fact that the camera has an STM or stepping motor lens. This means that it changes focus for you quietly and smoothly, so it doesn't disturb your recording. The other thing that autofocus can help with is getting a smooth rack focus. A rack focus is when you change focus from one point to the next. It's quite hard to do this nicely in manual focus, especially using only the focus ring on the lens. But in autofocus, the touchscreen makes this quite easy. You just tap on the first point that you want to focus on, and then you tap on the point that you want to shift the focus to. The camera will adjust the focus between the two points without you having to do anything else. It's quite a slow rack focus, but at least it's smooth. The only thing I would always choose to leave in manual is white balance. Setting your white balance manually will help you when it comes to editing your scene, because it will ensure a consistent colour temperature in each of your shots, which is important when it comes to editing your footage together. So having everything in manual does help you get better footage, but it's not essential. In fact, if you're just starting out, shooting an automatic may well be your best option. That way, at least you can concentrate on your composition and your content, which is the most important thing. Once you're happy with your focus and your exposure and everything like that, you can go ahead and record your footage. 
You do that by pressing the live view button, which is just here. As you can see, like most record buttons, it's marked to the red dot, although this one is just to one side. So let's just go ahead and press that now. When you press record, you'll notice that all the non-essential information disappears from the screen. You'll also notice there's a little red dot just here at the top of the screen, and that there's this counter here that's counting up from zero. They show you how long your clip is in minutes and seconds. To stop recording, you just press the Live View button again, and the clip that you've just filmed will be saved to the SD card. As you can see, these numbers at the top have returned to their original values, 29 minutes and 59 seconds. This is the maximum length of each clip, which is a standard limitation on most DSLRs. Don't worry though, if you're filming something that's long, the camera won't just stop recording after 30 minutes. It will carry on, automatically creating a new clip. This number here, next to the maximum clip length, indicates the amount of photos that you can take given the amount of space on your SD card. Talking of SD cards, for video, you need a card with a large storage capacity, so you can record for a good length of time. In this camera, we've got a 64GB card, which, as I mentioned before, is big enough for three and a half hours of HD footage. So if I turn the camera off, and if I take the card out, wait for it to finish. OK. Pop that, take it out. You need to make sure that the card is class 6 or above. And you can see that by looking on the front of the card. Here it says 64 gigabytes, and then there's 10C. So that's a class 10 card. This refers to the minimum write speed. So class 10 will give you a minimum write speed of 10 megabytes per second. Anything slower than class 6 won't be able to write fast enough, so always check to make sure that the card that you're using is able to cope with the demands of HD video. OK, so let me just put this SD card back in and turn the camera on, because next I want to go over how to review your footage. So turn the camera on and then turn it into movie mode. To review your clips, you just press on this blue playback icon, which is here, and if I press that, I'm presented with the last clip that I shot. You can scroll through the clips in exactly the same way that you would photos, and to play a clip, you simply press on the big arrow in the centre of the screen, so that's this arrow here. Or you can press the set button, which brings up the control panel at the bottom of the screen. The blue play icon is highlighted, and you can navigate to all the other icons by pressing on the control keys, either left or right. OK, so let's try this clip. If I press play, as it's playing, you'll notice that there's this blue bar at the top of the screen, which shows your progress. And then these numbers next to the bar shows how long the clip has been playing for. If you press the set button or tap on the screen, the clip will stop. And you'll be presented with all the controls at the bottom of the screen again. This icon here, up here, is for volume control, which you can do by tapping on the screen or by using this dial here. So if I dial up or down, you'll notice that the volume increases and decreases. And then the menu icon, if you tap on that, that will take you back to shooting mode. This icon here is for volume control, and you can adjust this on the screen or with this main dial here. If I dial it up and down, you'll notice that the volume increases and decreases. The menu button here will take you back to all your clips, and then down here you've got this scissors icon, which is for in-camera editing. I'm not going to go into that, though, because it's really not something that I'd recommend that you do. If you want to edit, do it on a computer, just because it's much easier. Then we've got the playback controls at the bottom of the screen. When you press them, they tell you what they're going to do. Like this one, if I press it, it says slow motion, which is really useful if you want to carefully review something. If I press stop on that now. I'll let you explore these controls in your own time, as they're pretty self-explanatory. Finally, to exit playback, you need to press on this blue button down here. So if I press that, that will take us back to shooting mode. OK, so that's pretty much everything that you need to know about the Canon 700D. It's an incredibly versatile digital camera that can take photos, as well as record high-quality video footage. As an entry-level DSLR, it's relatively easy to use. It's also easy to learn new skills on, and it has all the advanced controls and features that you'd expect to see on a camera like this. I'd encourage that you start using the manual settings as soon as you can. If you give it a go, I'm sure you'll soon be handling the camera like a pro. To help you on your way, look out for our other cab on training videos. So have fun and goodbye.